Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Krista Burns, uh, your host at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Library Commission's weekly online event that we do. Um, we cover Library Commission activities, any Nebraska library topics that may be of interest to librarians across the st or staff across the state. Um, we have sessions presented by Commission staff and we do bring in guest speakers. Um, these sessions are done every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time and we do um, record them so if you are not available able to see one of our live sessions you are able to um, listen to it on a recording this morning I am going to be presenting so we do not have any other speakers or guests on e-rate uh, this is a new part of my job here at the Library Commission um, something new that I've taken on this year and um, so we have a session today on some of the basics of the system of e-rate um, what it's all about to try and get people up to speed on how they can use it how you guys can use it for your libraries So here's just a brief overview uh, agenda of what we're going to go through today. I'm going to go through the basics of the program, how it's run, where it came from, that kind of thing. Um, eligibility, what kind of things you can get E-rate for, and discounts. Um, technology planning that you do have to do for some of the things depending on what you are applying for and just some other issues um, we're going through some of the applications the forms that you do and just some other it just as we go through it some issues that you might need to be aware of or want to be aware of throughout the as you're um, applying for and doing all of the everything that needs to be done to participate in e-rate so here's the basics of how e-rate got started what is it all about um, the FCC is the government agency that oversees the e-rate program they're the ones in charge of it they set the rules and the policies they um, you know the laws that are put into the code of the federal regulations handed down as here's what you can do here's what you can't do here's what's um, all the rules are for it they have a the universal service administrative company USAC is the company that has contracted that the FCC contracted with to actually administer the e-rate program they also administer other programs that are um, for getting funding to low-income areas those kind of things as well and e-rate is one of the four programs that they administer um, and the specific division of USAC that handles um, schools and libraries is the schools and libraries division SLD and that's who handles all of the um, e-rate for schools and libraries and that's who and I guess if I had another ta another bullet here there would be a fourth ta um, bullet that would be me here at the Library Commission um, each state across the country has some sort of person who is their e-rate coordinator who works um, who this uh, with the schools and libraries division of USAC to keep everyone in the state on track with what they're doing and um, to make sure you get everything you need to um, done now e-rate funding is done on a um, by year so every year you have to redo some forms some forms you do some forms you don't we'll go through that as we go through the session um, their funding year goes from July 1st through June 30th so the upcoming um, funding year for 2010 starts next July um, but right now is when you would be starting to f um, complete forms for next year's funding year um, the uh, E-rate program was created in 1996 by the 1996 Telecommunications Act, where um, 2.25 billion dollars each year is comes in from interstate phone revenues that are used to give um, libraries and schools, as you saw from before, um, refunds on some of their costs for telecommunications, telephone service, and internet access. Um, They can roll over. Sometimes there are unused funds, as it says here. Some libraries and schools don't get all the money that they apply for, or it's just not all asked for that is available in that $2.25 um, billion. And so sometimes they can roll over unused funds to give more funding out to libraries and schools. Now, today we're going to kind of focus more on libraries, because that's what I handle here at the Library Commission. But just so you're aware, it is also available to schools. And that is all handled by whole different people here in the state. Um, so as I said, schools and school districts can apply for it, libraries and library systems. And if you are in a consortia, they sometimes band together to, um, to get um, telephone service or internet access. And they, you, as a consortia, you'd also be available to have the whole consortia apply for uh, E-rate. 
Now, what about the discounts? What can you get? Uh, it will vary depending on some statistics. Um, anywhere from 20% to 90% of your costs can possibly be re refunded or paid back to you um, through the E-rate program. And this depends on the base this, these percentages on the National School Lunch Program um, to start with. So for school, it would be whatever the percentage of students that are eligible to to participate in the program. Now, this is not the number of students that actually participate. Um, you may have more students eligible than actually apply for it. So it's the number of students that are eligible. And for you as a library, it would be whatever school district you're in, that's the, the numbers you would use for that school district. Um, you also take that in conjunction with whether or not you are designated as an urban or rural for the location of your library. Now, how do you know these things? There is information is all out there for you to look up this these numbers and figure it out. The school lunch program data for Nebraska is available on the Department of Education website. So you can go there, and I've given you the link here. Um, don't worry about trying to write down all these links and things. Actually, I should probably have told you that at the beginning. Um, all of these links and URLs that are in here will be put up after the when the recording is posted to the Library Commission's Delicious account, so you'll be able to get all the links from there. But this is just a quickie reference. Um, you'll also be able to print out this PowerPoint presentation um, but we do have the I've, I'll be giving you the URL to get right to the Department of Education website and as you can see if you look at the very end of that URL the specific there's a spreadsheet an Excel spreadsheet that has the lunch counts for all of these school districts in the state and they have just put um, I'm not sure exactly when but I looked and they do have their 2010 um, statistics up so you'll be able to go there and find out what is the percentage of students in your school district that are um, eligible for the uh, school lunch program. Then also on the website for the USAC people they have a information about whether you are rural, rural or urban area. So you just go there, you'll look up your county. Um, it's arranged by state. You look up Nebraska and then you'll see a list of counties and that will be where you'll find that information. Um, once you have those two numbers, then there is a chart that you go to using those two numbers to figure out how much of a discount you will be eligible for. Um, the matrix is online um, at that URL I gave you, but I've also got it right here as well. As you can see what you're what we're talking about. Um, so you'll have to find out first what percent of students are elig eligible students for the school lunch program in your area. Figure that out and then figure out if you're urban or rural and that will let you know how much of a discount you may be eligible for. Now what can you apply for? What exactly can you get money for? There are two different levels of services that they have Break, broken everything out into. Um, priority one and priority two is what they call them. Priority one is funded first with the that two point um, two five billion that is available. Um, and then after those area those are funded, if there is money left over still, then they would go to priority two services, um, being the ones of the neediest applicants first, meaning the ones that are available need you know ninety percent or um, uh, from that discount matrix. So we're going to talk mainly today just about Priority 1, the basic services that you'd start with. Uh, we can get into other things in a later session if you have questions, but that's what we're going to talk about mainly today. There are two different Priority 1 services, telecommunication services and internet access. You can apply for one or the other or both. You do not have to apply for both internet and phone. If telecommunications, that would be your phone, um, your, your phone access to the, that you have in the library. Uh, local, long distance, anything that has to do with getting telephone access to uh, your staff in the library. The internet access is your basic access to the internet. If your library has internet in some way, shape, or form, that would be that. Now, as I said, some people have thought of E-Rate as, oh, well, it's for your internet. Well, and they don't realize it's also just for telephone as well. So keep that in mind. If you don't have internet or you don't want to um, comply with some of the rules that have to do with internet access, um, applying for E-Rate for internet access, which I'll get to later, um, you can just apply for um, monies for your phone access and save a little money there as well. Now, priority two is other things beyond your basic phone service and your basic internet access, um, inter internal collect connections, um, maintenance of these connections, your wiring, that kind of things, um, routers and servers and stuff. That would be priority two funding. That would be a, as I said, if there's money left over and if people are applying and asking for that, that's where that would come from. Now, what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about 
telephone, telecommunications, internet access, those priority two ones. Um, every year the FCC publishes a new eligible services list. So for whatever year you're applying for, you have to make sure you look at the correct list to see what is eligible this year. Um, this is the kind of thing that they update and make changes to and adjustments to over every year because there's new things coming out obviously as you know new technologies out there new ways of getting internet and phone and they've always got questions about things so they're always tweaking it every year um, so this is the list you would go to to find out exactly what is eligible and what isn't if it's on this list it's eligible if you can't find it anywhere on this list you have to assume it's just not something that you can apply for e-rate funding for um, and it is available on the website uh, you go to that URL there and you'll get the whole list. I believe I just looked at it yesterday. They've got both the 2009 and 2010 lists um, up there right now. Um, the process for doing E-Rate can go over, you know, multiple, you know, it takes, you're doing working on different years at the same time. So they still have the 2009 numbers up there for people who are processing their forms yet, yet for that. Um, so just make sure if you're applying for new E-Rate for the upcoming fiscal year for 2010 that you use the 2010 eligible services list. Um, but you will find it right there on that URL. Now all of this stuff that you're going to be using, the eligible services list information, your um, discount from the discount matrix there, all this is used to fill out the various forms that you have to go through, uh, that you have to fill out throughout the process of applying for E-Rate. Now there are four basic forms for applying for the service. All of them can be done online. Um, previously there were paper forms and I do believe paper forms are still out there if you do you know, want to access them. However, everything can be submitted online now. Um, you can go to the paper forms and print them out and you know, maybe get a heads up on what kind of questions they'll be asking. But you can also, if you print them out online, they really encourage libraries to do this. Uh, it it's, makes things go through your processes a lot quicker. You don't have to wait for things to be mailed that you're sending to them. Um, you know it's been sent. You get confirmations, email online confirmations that everything's been processed. So it's a much easier system. And also, um, I'm new to E-Rate <laughs> just this year, but I have heard that in the past it has been very painful using the different old forms and paper that people had to do. And that I, from what I've heard from people who have done it using these online forms, there's still a lot of information, there's still a lot of questions, but it's a lot easier than it used to be. <laughs> so possibly if you were wary of doing E-Rate from a previous experience years ago, try it now and see and you might you know, find it easier than what you uh, had experienced in the past. Now the four basic forms that you start out with is your 470 is your first one where you're telling both the E-Rate people, I want to um, have I want some sort of service, phone or internet, and I want to be reimbursed for part of the cost. Um, after you do that, you will get bids come in, and we'll go through that process. Then you'll have 471 that you'll submit saying, I've chosen a service provider from all the library, all the companies that bid on me based on my information of what service I was looking for in the 470. Then after you've signed your contract and your and your service has actually started, your, your subscription year has started, whatever it is, you s notify them using the 486 that you have started receiving the service. Um, this is a form that for some reason a lot of people forget to do. Um, it's not actually, it's basically just saying, yep, it's good to go, we've started. So 486 sometimes from libraries, it gets lost in the shuffle. Um, and then also at the very end, very important form, your 472 or 474, and I'll get into the difference between those two, the two different ways of where you can tell them, I've paid my bills and now I want my rebate, my refund, my E-rate monies. Um, so those are very important. If you don't do those, you don't get your money back. <laughs> um, all of these online forms are available on the um, USAC website. That's the universal service company there. So you can go there. That's the main page where you'll have online access to all of those four forms. Um, there's also instructions on there, which is really nice. They have step by, they have the forms themselves and then separate step-by-step -step instructions that you can use to follow along and figure out what you need to fill in. Um, when I've been looking at them, it kind of reminds me of doing uh, your tax forms that you have, you know, a certain number of pages that the actual are your tax forms that you fill out and then twice as many or three times as many pages explaining how to fill out your tax forms. <laughs> Same kind of thing here. You've got your instructions and you've got your forms and if between the two of them you follow, um, just go step by step through them, you should be um, good to go. Um, now you do need to keep track uh, copies of all of your paperwork and what you've done. Um, sometimes audits are done, sometimes there's they come back and ask more questions about things. So you need to keep uh, from whenever you started at five years after the last date of service, the last time you had service with a company providing you either with your phone or your internet access. 
So um, you'll want to have files set up for this, possibly binders, because there's going to be a lot of paperwork going back and forth and back and forth between you and the E-rate people. Um, so something to keep yourself organized for with all the forms and for each year of the forms. You will be dealing with multiple years and at a different stage in each step in each year and so you want to keep those separate so you know this is all of my forms and all my paperwork for the 2008. These are all my in this binder or in this file and these are all the ones for my 2009 in this file. And here's all the forms where I'm at now getting started with 2010. So keep them separated out that way but make sure you keep five years going back um, from you know, wherever you started. Now here is a, list, a chart. Now you don't have to try and read all this and know all this. Now we're going to go through each of these step by step. But this is a nice little chart for reference for you of all the deadlines and dates of um, the process. Uh, what the funding year is, what the forms are, what kind of things you get back from the e USAC, um, the, the SLD um, School and Library Division of USAC, um, how, what things will happen and at which times. So um, this is just a chart on this, but we're now going to go through each of these steps. So I'm not going to read it off of this here, but this is just a good thing that you might want to have as your own reference for what's happening when and what, what should happen next after you fill out a form. This is a good chart for that. Now I mentioned each of the years that there are for the forms and that every time you file a form they send you some sort of letter, a confirmation letter. Uh, you can see, actually if I go back here, uh, after you file your form 470 they send you a, let's see here, receipt acknowledgement letter. After you file your Form 471, you get a receipt notification letter. Every time you send them something, they send you something back telling you they got it, some sort of thing. And then you have a chance to um, make any changes, clarifications, make sure everything's correct. Um, you'll also get a funding commitment decision letter letting you know what kind of monies you're getting. Um, so you'll get a Form 486 notification letter letting you know that they've received that form for getting your money. So all these things you'll have to you'll be getting each year and let's see here. <laughs> um, what they have done in the beginning they didn't do much about it but they realized this is going to get very confusing as libraries were doing multiple years at the same time. Every year is color coded with three different colors and they just use them in a rotating um, system. So canary, yellow, pink, and blue are the three colors that they use and each year, as you can see here, I've got out um, what color each year is. So you, this is another way you can keep track of what's going on. When you get stuff from them, from USAC, uh, from the Schools and Libraries Division about your E-rate, it'll be in a whatever color applies to that year. So it's a good. this will be a good way to figure out what is this letter they're sending me for, which year does it apply to, so what do I need to go look at. So right now the ones that we're getting, if you're doing it at the moment for 2009, are all coming in yellow, the canary color. Um, when the 2010 letters start coming, they'll be coming in pink. So that'll be the next color they'll be using. So now we're going to, any questions so far on the basics of the system, of the program, how it works, what's it all about? Anybody want need any clarification on anything at the moment? No? Okay, then I will go on. Um, the next thing we have, I'm going to go through the actual steps of applying for the E-rate from step the beginning and on through. Uh, Oh, we do have a question here. Sorry, I didn't wait long enough for the typing to go through. Uh, Angel asks, if you already have an internet provider, is there a way to skip steps? Um, no, you won't be able to skip steps. You'll just be able to do it differently um, because you already have someone. Ideally, the reason you would need to fill out a new form is at some point, obviously, your, your account, your subscription is up and you have to renew. Uh, that kind of thing, or your um, it's a monthly subscription, so every month it's actually a new one. Um, so you'd still have to apply for something for a current one that you have uh, to to get the you know get all the information to the SLD people, and so that they know who it is that you're working with, and that you now want to be working with this internet service provider and getting e-rate for it. 
Um, now, once you already have one, then it does make it easier every year because most likely that'll be the same one you'll stick with. I mean, you'll get bids possibly, but your same one will probably still be the one that you would go with most likely you get, until so, unless some you know, other company comes into town and is suddenly you know so much cheaper and better. But you will have to go through the basic steps still, yes. Um, basically, it's just getting you and that ISP on the radar of the um, USAC people. So, there are seven basic steps in doing E-rate throughout the whole process of a year. And we're going to go through each one of them uh, one by one here. The first thing you need to do, there it goes, <laughs> um, possibly, now this, this actually first step would be, um, it would depend on what you are applying for, is do some technology planning. Write a technology plan. Now, you only need a technology plan if you are applying for E-rate for, e for your internet access. If you are only applying for E-rate for basic telephone service, telecommunications, your phone, long distance, that kind of stuff, and not for your internet, you do not need a technology plan. So this first step actually is only applying to people who are applying for internet. So be very aware of that. Um, you have a, there are five basic elements that the E-rate people, um, SLD requires you to have in a technology plan. Uh, now this is something you may be doing anyways or have thought about doing or, or in the process of doing for other things that you do at your library. And it's always a good idea to have one anyways, no matter what. A technology plans that you know what kind of things you need in the library, where your computers are at as far as needing new ones or updating them. Um, what have you done in the past? How are you going to keep up with things in the future? All that kind of stuff. It's always a good idea to have a technology plan in general. Um, and if you already have one, then you're already done with step one. <laughs> you can just say, here, this is the one that we've been using. Now I want it to be used for um, the E-rate. And they do have their own five criteria that have to be in the plan. Generally speaking, if you've written a pretty good one, you probably have mentioned all this stuff anywhere, but this is the kind of thing that you've got to check off one, two, three, four, five, make sure you've covered all these areas. Goals and strategies for using the technology in your library. Basically, why do we have it? What, what is it good for for our patrons and our services? Um, keeping staff up to date and trained on it, on the technology that you have. Uh, doing an assessment on a regular basis. Needs assessment of how what we've got, what do we need, how's it going. Um, making sure you have the budget to keep up with the technology as it changes over time in the future. Uh, and um, an evaluation. Going back and looking at these plans. There we go. I'm having a little delay with my um, PowerPoint of uh, advancing for some reason. Anyway, here's the specific um, write-ups right from the SLD's uh, criteria, um, exactly what they talk about as what they mean for goals and strategies and um, all the different areas uh, that I just talked about. So this is their exact wording. Um, from their website, so you have this as a reference for when you're working on your plan. I also have here the link to their website where they have a little more description of it, with basically what was on that previous slide, to their um, SLD's five criteria. Now, to help you out as well here at the Commission, we have had for quite a few years a technology planning worksheet that our um, library development people have put up that you can use um, basically just a fill in the blank sheet um, worksheet for doing a technology plan and I've given you the URL for that right there. Um, it'll have everything that you need to put in that covers the E-rate um, but also anything that you use other technology plans for as well for um, LSTA funding or just doing it in your own library um, this can be used and our um, the worksheet that we have is really nice. It has a lot of the basic information. It has explanations of the different sections too. So here where the, US, the SLD says goals and strategies for using telecommunications and information technology to improve library services. Okay, well what does that mean? On our worksheet we have a, not just the heading of that but a description and some examples of well, what would this mean? What do we mean by goals and strategies? Um, so it's got a little kind of like a built uh, built in into the worksheet instructions on what we're meaning, what you need to be putting in to answer these different questions and to fill in these different blanks. So I definitely strongly recommend. We have a lot of libraries that do this that use their worksheet on our website and just fill in the blanks, and then it works for everything. Um, these technology um, plans, once you have created them, you send them to me, 
Um, you used to send them to Richard Miller. He was the E-rate coordinator here before me. He's still at the commission. <laughs> he just does not do the E-rate anymore. Um, you would send your plan to me, and then I would look over it and evaluate it and um, approve it or send it back to you and say, well, this needs to be a little more, or that needs to be changed or whatever, letting you know um, what it is. Now, bef also, the plan has to be approved by me in order for E-rate to accept it as your technology plan that you're using to um, apply for the E-rate for Internet access. So that is something you'll have to send to me here. Um, and then also, as with the other paper, other forms, we said keep copies of it and the approval letter that I would send you. I send you all either um, try and email it as often as I can, um, but if I can't do that, I can mail you an actual approval letter that is my signature. And it said yes, this is the approved plan. It is, you know, it's got everything it needs. Now, as far as when you write this form, now you may already have one and you're good, that's great. Um, if you don't have one, it does need to be, now this is a, something that you need to, um, there's a slight you know, difference here. Um, you must have it written, some sort of creation date and draft form, the basics of it started before you file your 470. That's your very first form saying, I want to apply for E-rate. has to be written before you do that. If, now this is also all, don't forget, technology planning all only applies if you're doing internet access, if you want to apply for E-rate for internet. If you just want to apply for e, to E-rate for telephone, you can ignore all this technology planning section of this session. But if you're doing internet, you have to have it written before you file the 470. It does not have to be approved by me though. You just have to have it written, have a date on it that says this was created on whatever date and make sure it's a date that's before the date that you submit your 470. Um, now the whole point of, the, of it also is to support the services that you're requesting um, on the 470. So make sure that they match up, that what your technology plan says is also the kind of things and services and, that you um, say you want to get when you do fill out the 470. Um, you can write it a new one every year, but you can also should write, can write them um, up to, to cover up to three years, which is actually really good. You don't want to have to rewrite it every single year, um, but three years is the maximum that you can write it for. So you can say this technology plan covers us from 2008, 2009, 2010. Great. But it has to cover those funding years. It has to cover through the end of the funding year that you're applying to for. So you have to make sure that the form is dated saying this technology plan covers us through um, let's see, July July 30th, 2011, because that's the end of the 2010 uh, year for E-rate. So make sure it covers all the years that um, you are doing it for. But it can be multiple years. So if you do one that's multiple years, you do not need to redo it every single year to me. It's done once, it covers three years, then three years later you've got to do a new one. Now it has to be approved by July 1st before you can um, submit you are a 46 saying that you want your services, um, that you're receiving your services. So you have time from when you write it, you can start filling out your 470, you can submit your 470, you can submit your 471 saying we've picked our service provider and you can still be in the midst of tweaking the, the technology plan um, if that is still necessary. Um, but it definitely has to be started before that very first step of doing the E-rate. Um, process before the 470. But we have time to go back and forth with it to make it fit right before it actually needs to be approved by me. Oh, I'm sorry, there was another question that I missed earlier. Hold on, sorry. Ah, here we go. Oh. I believe it said, can you, uh, I think I it disappeared on me. Um, I believe, Janet, you had asked if you can go back and get reimbursement for previous years. Um, you, you have to have filled out the forms for previous. You can't go back and say, oh, we had internet access back in 2005 and want E-rate for that. No, there are deadlines for each year for each of these forms, so you have to have been in the, doing the process during the time for that fiscal year, for that year. Um, so you can't go back and, you know, backdate things or, you know, there's no grandfathering in saying we've had this internet service provider for five years and now we want rebates for all those years. No, you have to do it based on the year that you start submitting the forms, the 470. Now there will be in, um, some possible appeals that have to happen back and forth and uh, you, after you start filling out these forms and sometimes they um, USAC says well we're only going to give you this much of what you requested not all of it and you can appeal it and there could be back and forth that could take a couple of years to get 
done, but that we would have still had to have filled out the forms originally for that year. Um, all of this would have to be done um, at the original dates. Does that answer your question, I hope? Now, one other thing that you do have to be aware of, and this is something that some libraries have heard of and know about, is the SEPA Compliance, the Children's Internet Protection Act. If you are applying for E-rate for Internet access, you do have to comply with SEPA. Um, requires having a filtering software of some sort on your computers and having an internet safety plan for how you would deal with this kind of thing if it happened. Um, the software has to be on the computers, has to be installed, has to be a way also for staff at your library to turn off the filtering software for when people do need to use it unfiltered. Um, adults, anyone doing research on things that might be caught by the filtering software, that kind of thing. So that is part of the thing you can do. You do have the ability to turn it off. That is part of the SIPA. But if you are applying for internet access, E-rate for internet, you do have to comply with it. If you are applying for E-rate for just telephone, just your telecommunications, your, your local long distance, you do not have to comply with SIPA. It has nothing to do with talking on the phone. It just has to do with going on the computers, going on the internet. Now you can have apply for phone, E-rate for telephone, and have internet access at your library, and just not apply for E-rate for the internet access, and that's fine. You do not have to have any filters on those computers. If you're just, all the, all the the USAC cares about is what you're applying for. If you're applying for telephone, that's all they look at, that's all they care about. They don't care that you've got a computer without a filter on it if you're not applying to get money back from them for internet access. So I know there have been some people that have been confused by this and that people have been saying that, oh, E-rate is all about, got to have that compliance on and so I'm not going to do it at all. That's not true. Only if you're applying for internet. So you could say, if you're, some libraries I know, they do not want to have filters, they have issues with that, it's too much to deal with, or it's just not their um, philosophy to have to, to do that. Don't apply for a rate for internet access, and you're fine. Just apply for it to get some of your phone costs back, and it still will benefit you in some way. However, if you do want to get it back for e-rate for internet access, you will have to apply comply with it. Um, there's information on the um, website for exactly what they mean by it, what it has to be um, done, how it has to be handled. Um, and like I said, it's not saying oh, you have to have everything filtered and you have to block everything, end of story. If you do read and look closely at the Internet Protection, Children's Internet Protection Act, it does say, does have built in there that yes, it has to be on the computers, but also there has to be a way for staff to turn off the filtering for people that need to get past it for doing, depending on whatever they're doing research on. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about it. So that is step one, your technology plan. And like I said, it only applies if you're applying for internet access, if you're only applying for telecommunications, your telephone, you get to skip step one. <laughs> Step two would be filling out and submitting your Form 470 where you are saying, I want E-rate and I want someone to provide me with these services. And what you're actually doing is opening a competitive bidding process, putting out an RFP, basically letting service providers, telephone or internet, depending on what you're doing, let them know you are interested in getting service. So when you fill out the 470, it goes out public where these, these companies can go and look and see what 470s have been posted and then con contact you to say, here, we'll provide the service for you. Um, what you'd want to do on this form, it has, it's basically where you can say exactly what you need. Um, is it just for the library? Is it for a group of libraries? We have a bunch of branches. Is it for the whole system? Is it just for phone, just for local? Is it for local and long distance? Do we have voicemail? Whatever, that's all you put in there, letting them know this is the, what we need at our library. Now, you also have some timing that you need to think about when you're submitting um, your 470 because it relates to um, submitting your next form, your 471. There's timing that you have to know of. You have, there has to be a, enough time for companies, vendors, ISP, telephone companies to see your 470 and then to submit to you, here's our bids, and for you to look at them and evaluate them and decide who you might go with. So 
before you can choose a vendor, you have to give a um, good enough amount of time for that to happen. Um, and according to them, they, get, they want it to be 28 days before you do your next Form 471. So you have to make sure that you time it, that you do your 470, and then you wait 28 days before you choose your vendor and officially fill out your 471. Now there is a deadline for submitting the 471 as well, which affects when you, the, the last day that you can s submit your 470. 471, the deadline to submit that this year is February 11th. I'm guessing, it's in a future slide, I'm, yeah. <laughs> um, so based on that date, you have to back up and see, okay, well, what's the latest time I can possibly submit my 470 to get this process started and still have those 28 days available for bids to come in and for me to evaluate them. And that is January 14th is the last day that you can post your 470 and still be have those 28 days before you have to post your 471. Now all this stuff could be done before these dates as well. These are just the deadlines. Right now we've already got libraries doing their 470s, um, have submitted them, and they're out there. And they're thinking already about when doing the 471 because they've already had them out for a long time. Um, and actually it's a good idea to try and do them as early as possible if you can. Uh, the later it goes, there's going to be more people doing it. and. There's going to be always every year at the last week, there's a huge rush of libraries trying to get them in, and there may be delays of things getting processed, and you don't want that. It's also good just to get it done and over with and know that you've gotten it taken care of. But um, there are the deadlines to keep track of to make sure if you don't get your 470 posted before January 14th, you can't do it. You can't do E-rate for the next year at all, for the 2010 year. If it's already too late, you won't have the 28 days available to you for the bidding process. Um, now, for telephone services, it says here you do have to fill out your 470 every single year to redo that one. For um, internet access, you may have multi-year contracts and you have multi-year um, technology plans, so you don't have to do a 470 every year necessarily. So it's going to for that, it's going to depend on how long your contract is that you've made with your vendors. And let's see. Um, also, when you're looking at this, price has to be your primary factor in selecting a company if you do get multiple bids. Now, some of you, if you already got someone you work with, they may be the only one that contacts you and you just wait and they're the one you go with. Um, or you may only have one company that deal handles it for you. But you do have to have that be your primary factor in selecting who it is. The idea is to get the cheapest that you can. Now, you file 470 if you have no contract for the services that you want or a contract's going to expire that you currently have before June of next year. So that may help answer some of your question there, Angela, about if you have a current provider, it may depend on when your contract falls that you'd want, you'd need to be filing a new one. Um, and as I just said, if you have a multi-year contract, you can file 1470 that covers all, covers all the years of the contract. You don't have to refile the 470. You would have to do a 471 each, one, each time and just refer back to your original 470. You'll have a code number assigned to that one. Um, just some acronyms that go along with these. I'm going to have to speed up a little bit here. Um, your build entity number is an ID number assigned to your school. So you will have that will be assigned to you that you'll use on all of these forms. Also, a PIN will be assigned to the person who is doing the application. As soon as you uh, fill out a f your first form, you'll be assigned a PIN number that will um, be used every time. And this is used as your electronic signature. Um, after you submit your 470, you'll get a RNL, your receipt notification letter, letting you know, letting you know that they got the form and summarizing what you would um, put into the 470. And this lets you um, make any changes if there's anything was incorrect on it. Um, and then also they will refer to the ACD, the allowable vendor uh, contract date. This is that 28 days after the form 470 is posted that we talked about earlier. Now, after you've submitted the 470, that's when the competitive bidding process starts. It may or may not be very competitive, depending on your situation and what's available for you, your services in your area. Um, but as I said earlier, they have the information for the 470. They can go look it up on the SLD website, and then we'll contact you saying, hey, we'll be, we'll, we can provide this service for you. Um, to make sure it's open and fair process, that's part of the 28 days, giving everyone a chance to get a bid into you. 
and for you to have a chance to um, evaluate the bids. So that's how it makes it open if you're having that time limit. Um, and also using your cost effectiveness, cost has to be the primary factor in choosing which bid you do, you do which, which vendor, which company you do go with. Um, keep track of everything you're doing as you go through this process because you may have someone from SLD come back and ask you later on, well, how come you picked this one? Why? What was, you know, what was the decision-making process? Try and document everything you do. Have meetings, have board meetings, have stuff written down. Um, keep track of that. Um, the bid, obviously there's some acronyms and terms here. A service provider responds to your 470. That's the bid that comes in. And as I said, the price is a primary factor, something you'll hear a lot about as well. Um, now, after you have chosen who you're going to go with, that's when you go on to the next step, which is the 471, where you've evaluated the bids, you've chosen your service provider, you've signed a contract, then you post the, you submit the file, the form, <laughs> 471. And this is who, when you tell SLD the, the who you have chosen, um, provide who, let them know who will actually be receiving the service from this provider. Um, use the discount calculation information from that discount matrix that you use the school lunch program and your rural or urban designation um, will be included in there. Um, and then certify that you're complying with all the program rules, basically just saying, and this is all legal stuff we're talking here too. This is legally, you're saying, yes, I follow the rules. Yes, if we're doing internet, we've got an internet, a, a internet safety plan. We have filters. Um, I you know, certify that all of these information is correct, that kind of thing. And don't forget, this has to do with that 28 days, which I just went into earlier. You have to wait for 28 days to file your 471 after you filed your 470. Um, there, and there is, ah, there's the February 11th date that I remembered before. There is an application filing window for a 471. There's a certain block of time when you can submit it at all. It opened up December 3rd, just earlier, just a few weeks ago, and it goes through February 11th. So you have until then to file your 471. So a lot of this, these things of getting started revolves around this filing window. Once this is open, you know when your 470 has to be done by, and that's that January 14th date. So this is an important thing to know of as well, what, when the application filing window is. So you have until February 11th to do your 471, and backing up from that, you have till January 14th to do your 470. Oh, we have another question. Can my reason for whom I'm going with be just be that that's what the city county goes with and my library is part of the package deal? Well, if you're part of the package deal, that would be something you would have to work talk to the city and county about and see if it can then be pulled out and got e rate for. Um, I'm not actually sure how that would, how you would pull that out separately because you have to have bills and things that show that someone paid for it. Um, Because you can have um, state contracts and things that get applied, that do get done through E-rate as well. Um, I'd say that's something I'd have to check on because I'm not sure exactly how that would work. I know it gets done. <laughs> um, just don't know off the top of my head if there was some, what exactly a special process would be for that. But I can find out if you want to know more. If someone is interested in that, send me an email or a phone call reminder, and I can check on that for you, if that is something that you do do. Come on, there we go. After you submit your 471, you will receive your RAL, this time your receipt acknowledgement letter, where this gives you in, um, information about what was entered in your 471. So every time you submit a form to, to them, to SLD, they send you a, form, a letter back letting you know, we got it, here's what we think it says. Um, and this is where you can make any corrections, any changes if you need to, um, to your application. Um, after that is all gone back and forth, they will evaluate, see what they think about it, and you will get a funding commitment decision letter. This is what tells you how much money you actually are going to get, based on sometimes it's what you applied for, sometimes it might not be, it depends on what they had to, um, what they decided. So you'll let know, you'll, you know about um, what, monies you will get. 
And then this form is what is, this letter from them is what is used to submit your next form, your 486, that we'll get to in a second. So in this section for 471, you have your funding request number, which is assigned to your form 471. A lot of code numbers and things here that you'd remember, but all of this is referred to in your letters and forms. So that, uh, Um, your service provider identification number is your SPIN number. This is an ID number applied to service providers, your telecommunications, your telephone provider, your internet service provider. So you as a library has a BEN, your, 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 your member, and they have a SPIN number. Um, you can look up these SPIN numbers on, their, on the USAC website. However, also double check with your provider to make sure it's still correct. They sometimes change numbers, they change companies and things. So just double check with them to make sure that it is still the correct number. Um, your funding requests, okay. um, item 21 is a very important part of 471, and this is where you actually specifically say the services that you're get, go, applying for, is so what you use that eligibility list, eligible services list, um, to specifically say here's exactly what we want, here's exactly what it's going to be that we're going to be getting from this company that we picked. Um, and the Mercy Acknowledgement Letter, your RAL that I talked about. Um, Oh, we have another question here. At what point in the future, Angela asks, would someone start the E-rate process for 2011 or 2012? Um, each one, is, is there still enough time for 2010? Well, obviously I just told you that there is enough time for 2010 right now. You still have until January 14th to get that 470 in. Um, if you're just doing telephone access, it's just the 470. If you want to apply for internet, you've got to have a technology plan written before you do the 470. You don't have to have it approved by me yet, but at least have it written, have a date on it that says we created this technology plan on whatever date, just make sure it's before the date you submit your 470. So you still do have until January 14th to start the process for 2010. And then for each year following, it'll be the same kind of timing. Um, in the fall is when you start the process for the next fiscal year of E-rate. So the next step is five, is when the USAC people review your form set 471 to see if it's all up to snuff if the, the schools that you're applying for are actually eligible, if the services are eligible. They basically double check all your work is what the um, application review is for. Um, they may come back to you to ask for additional information, to ask for more clarification, for more details. Um, you got to make sure you reply to respond to these um, requests. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, to make sure that they've got all the correct information. Sometimes they only give you 15 days to apply to reply to a response to something. They will send you letters or emails to, with this information saying we need more information about that, we need more information about this, whatever. Um, make sure you're on top of those things and respond to them. You can also respond to them saying, we don't know, 15 days isn't enough time, can we, ha you know, let's, can we extend it and, you know, have more time to find out the information you need, and that's fine. At least you're getting, get back to them within whatever time frame they said they wanted to hear something from you. Um, so they're going to be, like I said, here reviewing anything and everything. Um, and as I said earlier, it, it can be confused. You may be doing multiple years at the same time you'll be working on, depending on what stage of the process you're at for each year. And having either separate files or separate binders for each year will really help you keep organized. And the fact that they send you things in certain colors, that'll help you figure out what you have for each year as well, those um, pink, yellow, and blue letters you get from them. You can um, also appeal things. This is where you can go through the appeal process. You would appeal to the SLD, the Schools and Libraries Division of the USAC. Um, if they deny it, you can go up to the FCC level if you want to. Um, they do grant many appeals, but it could take some time. So this may be something where you pay out the, inf the monies to your internet or telephone provider and then don't actually get reimbursed until like two years later. But, you know, eventually you might get it. Um, the appeals procedure is on their website. You can go there if you do need to do that, if something gets denied or you think maybe you should have gotten more than you did. The, our um, group that at USAC that actually does all of this um, evaluation is the Program Integrity Assurance, PIA. That's who will be contacting you about all of that. Now, after you have gotten through that and everything has been approved um, and you've gotten your um, funding 
commitment decision letter saying here's what we're going to give you, then you get to do your 486. This is though after the services have actually started. So you may get your decision letter, your funding commitment decision letter, and then it's actually three months later or two months later that the contract actually starts. you got to wait until that actually starts and you've actually paid to say, yep, we've gotten the services, it started. Um, you will, um, this is, and before this is where you have to have that technology plan approved by me before the 486, that's this timing. Um, TPA, that's technology plan approver, that's me. <laughs> so you would need to have that letter that I sent you on hand and say, yep, it's been approved, we have a form. Now remember, technology plan, this is just for internet. If you're just applying for phone, ignore that part. Um, also, if you're doing internet, this is where you'd also be saying, yes, we comply with the SIPA. Um, the, there is also a deadline for this. You have to f submit your 486 in, within 120 days after your service contract start, your, your service starts. Uh, the contract date, whatever it is, um, you've got 120 days to submit your 486. Or 120 days after the date of the funding commitment decision letter, whichever one's later. So between those two things, you'll have to figure out and calculate the 120 days. Oh, Laura, I see um, you had said you had to pop out for a computer issue. No problem. Yes, absolutely. Um, we'll, we'll have you put in for these. Uh, I will have you submitted for the, your CE credits. No problem. Okay, back to this. So your Form 46 notification letter is issued to after you have submitted your 46, so that'll be their response to you in the appropriate color, saying, yep, we got it. And then the last step is actually invoicing them, telling them we've paid our bill and we want our money back now. Um, there are two different ways that you can receive your discounts um, using a bear form, which is a 472, or a spy form, which is a 474. Build entity applicant reimbursement and service provider invoice. Um, and the difference between those is the bear form is filed by you after you have paid the service provider, your phone company, your internet company. You've, fi you've paid them and now you're saying to USAC, hey, we've paid them reimburse, you know, give us back the money that we applied for that you um, committed to us. The SPY form is filled by the service provider after you've been billed um, for the non-discounted portion of the cost. So basically, in, in if you use the SPY form, you get a bill from your internet service provider already discounted. So you get a discounted bill from them to start with, and then they have to get their, mon their money back from USAC. With a bare form, the internet service provider has, paid, has billed you for the full amount, and now you, as the library, are getting your money back from USAC. So it depends on how you want to do that. It's a local decision. You can do it either way, and you may just need to work it out with your service provider what they want to do as well. Depends. Um, but you can do um, either one of those to get the money, have the money processed through. Um, and there are deadlines for those as well. Um, uh, Bear form due October 28th. It's 120 days after the last service date of the previous year, which is June 30th, um, as going by the um, E-rates fiscal year. Or 120 days after the date of the Form 46 notification letter. So there's going to be, depending on when these letters get sent, when you submit forms, when they send you letters, may tweak and adjust when your dates are, where your deadlines are for some of these things. Um, does sound confusing because this one and also the previous ones, the, the, the 20, 120 days would depend on two different things. A really nice thing on the website for the SLD, they actually have a place where you can go and check dates. You can plug in a number and say, we actually, our service started at the end of this time and our form, our form 46 letter came at this time. What is our deadline? And it will spit out that number for you, or that date for you. So they've got that really nice, they have that on their website. And at the end of here, I have general links to everything on their, their website that you can go to. So if these kind of deadlines are confusing when it could be based on this, it could be based on that, just use the calendar thing on their website and it will tell you right off the bat what it is. So your bear 
is the, you'll get, if you submit a bear, you'll get a letter back from them telling you that it has been processed. And you'll receive a report um, detailing all the invoices, whether it's a bear or a spy, depending on which one you've done, whether you've gotten the money back direct to the library or you've got, or the internet, or your service provider has gotten the money back. Um, you'll have a, form, or a report of that that you can, um, just letting you know what's been done. Um, good idea to take a look at this report, make sure it's being done right, compare it to the forms you filled out, compare it to the, the invoices you submitted to um, USAC because there may sometimes be a discrepancy or there may be errors or something. Um, every time you get a letter back from them, a notification letter, a report, um, a receipt letter, double check it, compare it to what you submitted make sure things got done correctly, or make sure if something has been changed. They may have decided, well, we're not going to do this, this wasn't really an eligible service, whatever. Look at these letters and compare them to your previous things and see if they match up. And if they don't and you can't find a, there's no explanation on there, contact them and find out what's up. They'll have contact information on the letters, there's contact information on the website. Um, you'll be able to contact them and question what, why there's a difference if there isn't something on there. Okay. Now, as I said, you can contact them. Um, the USAC SLD people, their, their help desk is called the Client Service Bureau. So this is like their customer support, their custom um, area. Um, they have an 800 number that's right there that you can call anytime with any questions you have. And they have an e online email form um, that you can fill out. If you go to that URL, it'll give you a form where you, you put, submit whatever your question or problem is, and then they would email back to you in response. So either way, you can call or email them with any questions that you have um, if you're having issues with things. Now, of course, you can also call me, too, <laughs> here at, in Nebraska. I am your E-rate coordinator for the state. So if you want to do a local thing first and call me and see if I can answer your question or help you out, that's perfectly fine. Fine. Sometimes, depending on the question or the problem, it might need to be bumped up to them, to the Client Service Bureau. If it's not something I can find out or I can fix or change for you, we might just have to bump it up to them. Um, but it's up to you. If you'd like to call them, that's fine. If you want to call me, that's fine too. Either way, we're both um, available uh, for you. Um, and then there's the general website URL for the USAC website. Uh, Janet has a question. Many deadlines. Do you have a list where I can print and check off as I go? Actually, yes. <laughs> um, were you peeking at my slides? <laughs> there is actually a, um, and that's on the next slide here, a couple of different things that you can use to keep track of what's going on. Um, here on this slide, the final link, there's a, a flow chart that is a chart of everything that you need to do. It's more of a graphical thing showing what form you submit, what letter they send back to you, what form your service provider might submit for doing their billings and whatnot. It shows you back and forth the whole process so you can figure out where you are in the process. Um, also, you can use, let me go back to it, where'd it go? This chart, this table that I did before, the um, forms and deadlines chart, this is something else that you can use to help keep track too. It's a nice, you know, quickie um, list of when things happened. Um, now this specifically also, now be aware, this, because I'm doing this right now, this session, the dates on here are the dates for the current fiscal year, the January 14th deadline, or the February 11th deadline. Every year those dates will be different. Every year they, they issue different just because of timing and when they do things. So you can't say that every year it's February 11th. It's going to vary. <laughs> It'll be sometime in February probably, but it won't always be. This is specific for this current upcoming funding year of 2010. But this will give you the basics of it. And then also that chart, that flow chart, if you go to that on the website, that's a really nice one. I actually use that myself a lot <laughs> um, of where you are in the process. And this process, flow chart is nice. It gives you what you're doing and what your service provider may be doing, just so you know what they've got to be keeping track of as well. And that's kind of nice to know also. <laughs> Janet says, no, I did not look ahead. That's okay. <laughs> um, you just led into the next slide nicely. <laughs> now, also, other useful things on their website, they do these news briefs every week or so, and they have them all posted on their website. Just up-to-date information, if things have changed, when deadlines are, um, the um, schools and libraries news briefs. Definitely take a look for that at that. And you can sign up to receive them e through email to you, to you yourself. I have signed up for them in my um, 
um, email. So you don't have to go there every time they send one. You'll automatically get an email to you if you want to. Um, doing those, new, those news briefs. Very, very useful information coming directly from the SLD people. Um, also, they've set up some nice tip sheets, a whole list of PDFs that just give you tips, tricks, instructions, why do I want to do this, how do I do this, um, on that one website, so on anything, any steps you can think of to do for the service, for the process, um, you'll find a tip sheet there on how to do my technology plan, why do I want to do a plan, what's this part of this form or that form, basically some, you know, kind of a frequently asked questions thing, but tip sheets of all the what you want to be aware of. Um, and also just explore that whole SLD website, the main URL here, usac.org forward slash SL. There's a lot of useful information on there. There's PowerPoint slides, there's video tutorials, there's the those seven steps I went through, they've got them all laid out there as well with all the description and instruction on what you're supposed to be doing at each step. Um, you can you know, it's it's an it's a great website. Uh, this is how I've been teaching myself how to do E-Rate because, like I said, I'm new to it this year and I'm trying to learn it just as well as as anyone else who's new to it. And they have all the steps laid out there really nicely on their website. There's a lot of information, but just you know, focus in on the things you need and you'll get the help you need from there as well. And of course, you can always contact me with questions. As I said, I am your E-Rate coordinator now for Nebraska, and I can help answer any questions you may have, or find out what the answer is if I don't know it off the top of my head. So that is the end of my presentation. A very quick overview of the basics of E-Rate, of how it works, the different forms you fill out, the different steps you take. Um, anybody have any final other questions that they want to ask? Um, for those of you that have microphones, I will unmute you. I had I'd done that a couple times earlier. Um, anybody have any other questions? You can talk or you can type into our questions section. I can answer them for you here before we wrap up. No, I know it was a lot of information to absorb. <laughs> uh, it is a very com a pretty complex process, but I think if you just follow the steps and do each one one at a time, you can get your make your way through it. Um, this PowerPoint presentation will be posted up on our website when with the um, when the recording goes up of the session. The links will all be linked from that as well, so you'll be able to jump quickly to all these URLs that I've listed in the PowerPoint. Um, and of course, like I said, give me a call. Any questions? Any confusion? If you want to know when you're supposed to be doing something. <laughs> Anything else anybody needs? Any questions you want? Any comments? No? Okay, well then thank you very much for attending. Uh, I hope you will join us next week. Our Encompass Live will be on um, will be on Discount shopping with the Nebraska Library Commission. Any di di discounts you can get by purchasing databases, services, supplies, conference things, whatever, through the commission. We have a lot of those that we do. And Susan Nisley here at the commission will be giving you an overview of all those different ways that you can save money on a lot of your library needs. So I hope you'll join us for that next Wednesday. So thank you very much for attending. Bye-bye. <laughs>